Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Today I'm going to be covering an episode from Season 5, The Rebellion, directed by Harvey Laidman, written by Kathleen Height. If you're enjoying these, please do hit like and subscribe. We have two storylines going on in this episode. Both deal with a degree of rebellion. One being Olivia, who is just going through a tired of her life phase. You know, she wants to be able to change up something, whether it's her hair or what she's doing or just something, what she's wearing. She, everything to her feels like the same old thing. Uh, early on, we see her with a curling iron, trying to figure out something different to do with her hair, but she keeps getting blocked at every turn where everybody in the family and John, you know, they're all saying, no, but I like your hair the way it is, or I like that dress, or you always look nice, or what you cook is always great, it's always the same, and that's her whole point, is everything is the same. Um, whereas Grandma is uh, facing a different dilemma because there is another member of the congregation who plays the church organ. Well, you know, it is possible that someone else could play the organ. Well, who else is there? Zelda Maynard. Jason was over in Weston. Jason. Zelda Maynard. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, Grandma is in a position where Reverend Fordwick wants her to share the duties of playing the church organ. And Grandma's rebellion is that she doesn't want to have to do that at all. And what is she going to do about that? When we first see Zelda Maynard playing the church organ, um, it just brought to mind, although I believe that organ did make sound, um, I'm not entirely sure that anybody was ever playing it. Uh, John Walmsley may have actually played a bit of the organ. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but oftentimes those instruments that you see don't actually make sound and they they just work out all of that sound either uh, in pre-records or in post-production sound editing. Here we see where the family has gone on a little picnic and they've picked a lovely little spot, um, which I believe this was shot right near the Drusilla's Pond location on the back lot of the studio. And here they have brought in some sort of a, a picnic bench and a little swing. And, you know, so they've created a little picnic area there. And then at one point, John and Olivia, Olivia takes off for a walk and John goes to find her and they sit by the water and, and um, have a conversation. So beautiful little picnic spot. We've talked a lot about how Michael never ate uh, and sometimes she would take tiny little bites or pretend to eat. In this case, because there's a point about mama's fried chicken, uh, she does indeed have to at least pretend to take a little bite. And I think she does take just the, the tiniest bite of chicken here. And that was sort of Michael's way of dealing with all of the food elements within the show. There are a couple of points where they use these, what we would call a tracking shot. Nowadays, those would mostly be done with a steady cam uh, because they could cover all this uneven ground without the camera being shaken all over the place. In this case, I mean, Mama and Grandma take this long walk through the bushes and the jungle area of the back lot. So whether they had to lay dolly track uh, and, and rigging to do that, or whether they had a vehicle that the camera was mounted in that led them, I don't really remember which way they went with that. Seems like it would be a lot of dolly track to lay, so they may have used some form of a, like a dolly truck, uh, or just mounted it in the back of the regular truck or some camera equipment uh, to get this. But I love how they move in and out of the bushes and yet the camera continues to pick them up. These kinds of scenes are handy because it's sort of all in one. They aren't doing a lot of cutting into a lot of close-ups and back and forth. So a shot like this might take some setting up, but once you're doing it, it's like one and done. You know, you don't you don't have to keep resetting for lights and all kinds of things to get multiple angles. So they're a handy sort of way to speed up filming. Olivia is really surprised by everyone's reaction to her wanting change when she talks about wanting to cut her hair. And John's like, you're not cutting your hair. And she's thinking, it's my hair. I'll cut it if I want to. And she's a little surprised by John's um, John's attitude about it, or Grandma's confusion about why would you want to change anything, you know? So Olivia's getting very frustrated with that. 
while then grandma is getting very frustrated and when she, she finds out about the organ playing about having to share it gets passed around initially john boy finds out about it from reverend fordwick and then grandpa finds out about it and and it keeps Reverend Fordrick doesn't want to tell Grandma, so he wants John Boy to tell Grandma, and John Boy doesn't want to do it, so he tells Grandpa and says Grandpa needs to tell her. <laughs> and so, because everyone knows she's going to be upset about it, so no one wants to be the bearer of that unhappy news. After Grandpa does break the news to Grandma and sort of, you know, talks her around to understanding how it is really her Christian charity should lead her to being willing to share that that's a very Christian thing to be doing. So she finally does kind of come around, but then Zeb feels badly for Esther. And so he goes to speak with Zelda and to try to sweet talk her into being willing to give up playing the organ because Esther has played it for so long and what it means to her. Well, Zelda is a huge flirt, and of course, the women are always flirting with, with Zeb. So while he's sort of trying to sweet talk her into letting Esther play the organ, Esther walks by and sees the two of them on the porch. Well, of course, that puts her nose way out of joint because she doesn't understand what Zeb's doing. And then I love this, <laughs> this um, townsperson who kind of comes by and sees Zeb and Zelda and then sees grandma and you know it's like so what's wrong with this picture and of course then Esther is humiliated because she feels like you know she was put in a really awkward position and that Zeb is you know making life difficult for both of them and, and misrepresenting what is going on. Esther goes by Ike's store and uh, finds out that Olivia is there and Olivia is there getting a permanent and she has this look at this huge old contraption they used to use to give someone a perm and of course it is a complete disaster. Esther tries to express herself to Reverend Fordwick and what this means to her and ultimately she just sort of gives up um, in her frustration of not being able to get him to recognize how hurt she was by this. Olivia is horrified when she sees the results of this perm in her hair and she tries to sprint home and hide and you sort of, I love this shot where we see the reflection in the front window of the truck as John is watching her run into the house. And then of course there's a point where she reveals what's happened to her hair to the whole family and everybody is just in total shock. Feeling desperate to find a solution to the problem with her hair, Olivia has tried combing it out, she's tried washing it out, she's tried all kinds of stuff. Um, and I think for women we can relate to, maybe some of you men as well, when you do something with your hair that isn't at all what you wanted and you're stuck with it, it's going to have to grow out in some way, uh, but it is really an uncomfortable situation to deal with. and. In desperation, she goes to Verdi, thinking, you know, that uh, that Verdi might understand. And she sort of says, "Well, how do you straighten your hair?" And, and Verdi, like everyone else, can't help but sort of gently laugh at, at Olivia's predicament. I was sort of of a mind to change things, and you did, oh, Olivia. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. I'm getting used to it. And explain that she doesn't have any more of a solution for how to straighten their hair to um, give that advice to Olivia, but she does have another suggestion for her. Despite not wanting to attend church and have to watch Zelda play the organ, Grandma is sort of goaded into it by, in a sense, being told, well, that's fine, you know, that you're willing to give up church and and I'm sure that'll be fine. And, and she's like, I'm not giving up my faith and my... my um, connection to the church. So she storms off to go to church and just has to put on a brave face and listen to Zelda play. And Zelda doesn't do all that well. She makes mistakes and things like that. Um, but there's a really cute sort of uh, tag at the end of the church scene when grandma goes outside and is greeting the reverend. And 
and the same townsperson who had seen Zeb and Zelda chatting on the front porch uh, now nods in approval as Zeb you know, gives Esther a little, a little peck on the cheek. And uh, so I thought that was a nice, what we would call a button to that little storyline with that townsperson. And this was um, a woman who quite frequently did work on the Waltons as a background or extra um, and was seen a number of times in different scenes. Never, never with dialogue, but these little silent bits that just helped tell the story. And, and that's what good background people do, you know, the people who do it professionally. They, they can add these wonderful little elements to a story without using words, and it, it really does make a difference. The solution Verdi has helped Olivia find for her hair for now is that um, she has a turban, much like Verdi often, almost always wore. You saw Verdi wearing a turban, and so she has shown Olivia how to wear this turban, and we get the sense that that's what Olivia's going to do for a while. And John decides that uh, to help Olivia feel better about herself and also for a little change for her, that he's going to take her away for a night together at a hotel. So that was really sweet that he sort of stopped pushing and making fun of her or objecting to what she was doing, but showed some understanding of just this moment, this this little phase that Olivia was experiencing and was there to sort of support her in that moment, even though he didn't understand it. A few interesting things about this episode to me, one being that this whole thing with Olivia, where clearly her hair was going to take some time to resolve, and yet the very next episode, her hair was back to its normal style. So that was a difference in shows during the time period of the Waltons and today, where they Although the stories sort of continue, they weren't serialized where they were exactly continuing from one episode to the next. So they could sort of jump time in that sense and decide that by the next episode that we see, Olivia's hair is back to normal. <laughs> um, also, just the messages. I love that there were a number of messages in, in this about wanting change, you know, Olivia wanting change. Um, and grandma not wanting change and you know just I think recognizing that we should look for ways to be grateful for what we have and appreciate the things that we have and not worry so much about the things that we don't have and that you know there's loving relationships that help support that you know there's Olivia and John and Zeb and Esther but then you have people like Zelda Maynard and Mrs. Brimmer, who are, they would like to have a loving relationship and they are missing having that in their life. So we see that contrast. Um, and again, real life and the things that uh, different people have different struggles that they're dealing with in their life. And so the show was always highlighting things like that, like two sides of one aspect of life, which was which was lovely. Um, the actress uh, who played Zelda Maynard uh, was an actress named Audrey Christie, and she was a Broadway actress and had done a lot of musicals. She was in Maine, The Unsinkable Molly Brown. She was in the movie Splendor in the Grass and Carousel and Barney Miller, Starsky and Hutch, Police Woman. So as I was looking through her bio, I was like, wow, you know, she had a tremendous career. She was in um, I don't know if she was in the Broadway productions of Mame and Unsinkable Molly Brown, but she was in those movies. Um, and then I, I was looking through pictures. She had worked with Spencer Tracy and Natalie Wood and Lucille Ball and Warren Beatty and Humphrey Bogart. So here is another case of an actress with a tremendous career who came in to do an episode of The Waltons. And we were so fortunate in that sense to have so many amazing performers on camera and behind the scenes that worked on our show and helped make it the wonderful quality show that it was. And there you have it for this episode of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. I will be back with more Behind the Scenes of the Waltons and more of your questions in a segment of Ask Judy. Thanks for watching.